It's pretty normal to see the president tied to policy measures. After all, that's who's in charge of the United States, and Americans tend to give credit and place blame with the occupant of the Oval Office. In reality, the success and failure of policy measures often rests largely on another branch of government, Congress. The president can propose new policies left, right, and center, but under our Constitution, the job of making proposals into law rests with the 100 senators and 435 representatives in the U.S. Capitol building. So when something like the fifth stimulus plan gets deadlocked, you can bet that it has less to do with what the president does and more to do with what Congress isn't doing. And that's worth some roasted opinions. I'd like to start by pointing out my favorite political dichotomy. Gallup has been tracking America's approval of the job that Congress does since 1974. For 46 years, they've been asking us what we think of the job Congress does. And in 46 years, that approval rating has gone over 50% only between September 1998 and April of 2003. Most of the time, Congress has problems achieving a 40% approval rating, and the last time it was at least that high was February 2005. In November 2013, it dropped as low as 9% approval, and yet most of Congress still gets re-elected. Two-thirds of the Senate has been re-elected, with 15 senators who have served for 20 years or more. Nearly 80% of the members of the House of Representatives have been re-elected, with 61 members who have served for more than 20 years. Senator Patrick Leahy has been a senator from Vermont for 45 years now. Chuck Grassley has been a senator from Iowa for 39 years. The Dean of the House, Don Young of Alaska, has been the representative for that state for 47 years. Steny Hoyer has represented Maryland for 39 years, joining the House just a few months after Chuck Grassley joined the Senate. Maybe we benefit from their experience, but I really don't think so right now. Critical legislation has been tied up for months in Congress, and they've been doing that in every Congress since I was a kid. Part of that's because there hasn't been a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate since the early 1980s, and part of that's because the House and Senate have been controlled by opposite parties 14 of the last 40 years. And yes, part of it's because during the last 40 years, we've only had 10 years in which Congress was controlled by the same party which controlled the White House. Gridlock is the norm when Congress is divided. When one party controls both houses, major legislation tends to get passed quickly if the Democratic Party is in power, while the GOP tends to pass little in the way of new legislation. Part of that's the nature of the parties. Liberals in American politics tend to favor change, while conservatives in American politics tend to favor maintaining the status quo. Before 2017, I would never have expected those tendencies to shift much either, but 2017 changed a lot of things. The GOP began to rally behind the president, who is unlike most conservatives who came before him. Donald Trump may be a conservative, but he's also an activist president. When the GOP stopped fighting with him and started to rally behind him, the congressional gridlock should have lifted. Instead, it merely deepened. And that's part of the problem. Gridlock. With the crisis brought on by COVID, many states have effectively been shut down for the last six months. Those states which delayed their shutdowns or which reopened for business before the rest of the nation have been taking a beating in the national press. The reopenings are not even full reopenings either, but we're still hearing a lot about how many people will die because businesses reopened too soon, because some schools are holding in-person classes again, or because people simply choose not to wear masks thanks to the loophole built into virtually every masking law. The thing is that the economy took a big hit with the shutdowns and is still trying to recover from that hit. The record low unemployment figures of 2019 have been replaced by a big surge in unemployment from non-essential businesses either transitioning to no-contact sales or shutting down entirely. That many job losses caused a crisis in personal finances, which is where the stimulus packages come in. We've had four so far, and they've helped out many people. With the lockdowns continuing, though, we've been contemplating a fifth stimulus package for well over a month. Now, it's not good practice to plan our finances around receiving money which is still pending approval, but a lot of people in America have had little choice but to do just that. 
The states have individually decided whether they would remain closed or partially reopened, but no state is completely back to business as usual. Personal finances are taking a beating and a lot of people need help from the government badly. Others who are doing okay despite the shutdowns are keen to see stimulus come in too. That stimulus means the difference between survival and bankruptcy for a lot of businesses with otherwise sound business models. It means that a lot of purchases normally pushed back during an economic crisis can still happen. It means that payments on purchases made on the assumption of income now lost to COVID can still be paid. If we are going to remain on even a partial lockdown, then we need the next stimulus bill to get through Congress. Yes, normally I would oppose such a huge expenditure of government money, especially when it's coming as an emergency appropriation. But like I said, these aren't normal times. Yet the House and Senate has passed a pair of bills which are trillions of dollars apart, and neither side seems to be prepared to budge in negotiations. The Senate is willing to add some money for some measures which they don't support, but not enough to double the amount of money they put into their HEALS Act. The House is willing to drop about a trillion dollars out of their HEROES Act, but not by cutting the amounts on programs like $900 billion plus dollars they've pledged to send state and local governments. The fact that the state and local governments did not ask for that much money is entirely beside the point. Neither side seems willing to approach the matter as a bipartisan measure, which has to be worked out swiftly. Instead, they've decided to go into recess with the matter unsettled. That means all of those people who have been waiting for these stimulus measures are stuck waiting longer. The president seems to have noticed as he signed four executive orders to ensure that at least some of the most important measures are supported. The immediate reaction from Congress should have been to hurry up and conclude the negotiations. Instead, many members have decried the executive orders as illegal. And you know, they're right. These executive orders are likely illegal, as they order the expenditure of federal money without an authorizing appropriation. But, as I pointed out earlier, getting these measures going is essential with shutdowns still happening and over 16 million people either unemployed or only partially employed due to COVID. People are counting on Congress to do their jobs, and yet the Congress is headed home for the traditional convention recess. That is completely unacceptable. We need to look at what our senators and representatives are actually doing. If they aren't doing the work we elected them to do, then we need to elect other people. And we really need to impose term limits on those offices. It's ridiculous that members are sitting in the same seat for over 40 years. It's really not acceptable for them to remain in that seat for more than 12 years, in my opinion. Not if they're going to keep taking vacations while critical legislation is stuck in Congress.